Hey everyone, welcome to another online service of Branches Baptist Church. My name is Jake Woodfin. I'm the lead pastor. And I tell you what, we have now just gotten back into the purple tier. And I don't know about you guys, but that depresses me a lot, right? And it's kind of depressing. It's like, is this ever going to end, right? This is the third time or fourth time or a hundred time that San Francisco has gone backwards. And it can get depressing, right? Everything that you're used to, going to the gym again finally, getting out, maybe going with more friends, is now going backwards, even to a shelter-in-place order. And so it becomes very difficult to keep living this way, to keep going on, and you just get saddened and depressed and like, what in the world is happening, right? Maybe some of you too, you lost your jobs again, right? You got laid off again. Things were opening back up and now again, you're not a central worker and so you've had to stay home. It's hard. It's tough during this time. And so today's message I've entitled Purple Tear Again, but still we say amen. You know, there's this word amen and really it's this old Hebrew word that was translated directly into Greek and started being part of the Greek language and then from there Latin and English and it's really actually become a universal word. It's kind of like the word okay, right? You go into different countries around the world, people use the word okay. But amen is the same way. It's a universal word that's used all over the world by Christians that use it at the end of their prayers or in agreement with something. And we use it all the time, right? Um, my son, Zion, he's one and a half. And when he first started speaking, I think his first couple words that he used really was maybe mom and then dad. But I'm pretty sure the third word that we ever heard him use was the word amen. You know, we'd be praying and for a meal or something before and we'd say amen and he would say, amen, like that. It wasn't exactly amen, but it was close enough. And he would say that, and it just was part of his vocabulary, even at an early age. And for many of us, it's the same way. We use the word amen all the time in our prayers or in agreement with something. But I wonder if how many of us actually know how the Bible uses the word amen. How many of us actually know what it means, really? I know I didn't for a long time. I would use it as just kind of like, oh, that's just what you say at the end of a prayer, right? It, does it have a, an actual meaning? I didn't know. And, and how does the Bible use it? And how does Jesus use the word amen? You know, the word amen, it actually means to let it be so, right? It's almost a prayer in of itself. So when you pray something or when you're confirming something, you're saying, God, let this be so. Let it be. Let this happen, right? That's what you're saying with the word amen. It's also very close to the Hebrew word aman, which means to believe, right? To believe. And so you're also confirming this idea that you believe in what was just said. You believe in what the prayer and that God can answer the prayers that you're praying. And that's what it means to let it be so. And when you look at the New Testament specifically and the way it uses the word amen, you know, it's in, when it's used in the beginning of a sentence, the actual Greek word, it's usually used in a way of saying like verily or truly. It's, it's a way of presenting truth. But the way we use it most commonly today and the way the New Testament uses it also is to use it at the end of a phrase. And when you use it at the end of a sentence, of a phrase, of something, you're, you're saying let it be so. You're giving this confirmation to let it be. And if you look at all of those different times in the New Testament that the word amen is used at the end of the sentence like that, it's very interesting. You see it used in two major ways. And these two major ways emerge from all the different variations. And the first one is this. The first one is a proclamation of the grace of Jesus Christ that comes to all of us. It comes to you, that comes to me. Let's look at a couple verses. So verse, first, let's look at Hebrews 13, 25, and also Titus 3, 15. It's the verbatim, the same words are used. It says this, grace be with you all. Amen. It's this proclamation of, hey, let grace, let the grace of God be with you always. Amen. Let it be so that you receive grace. 
It's used again in Ephesians 3.21 like this. Grace be with all that love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. See, grace is the unmerited favor that we receive from God. It's this, this gift of God. We don't deserve it. We're not owed it. And yet God gives it to us to help us through life. It's really the strength that we need to continue to endure. It's the strength that we need because we don't have. In James chapter 4, it lists all of our faults. It lists all these sins and how we're just evil to our core and how we have a lot of sins in our hearts and how we make mistakes and how we mess up. But in verse 6, it says this, But God gives more grace. That He giveth more grace. He gives us this grace to endure. So despite all of our flaws, despite all of our problems that we have, despite all the things that are going wrong, God gives us grace to press on. He gives us the grace that we need to keep going forward, to keep moving on, and to give us the strength that we need to continue no matter what, to endure all the things we have to endure. And he gives us that strength through his grace. You know, in 2 Corinthians um, 12, 9, Paul is praying this prayer. He has this thorn in the flesh that he calls it, this situation, this problem, this ailment. We don't know exactly what it was, but it was something that was hurting him very deeply. He even called it a messenger of Satan to buffet me, right? A messenger of Satan that's just sent to hurt me, to bring me down. And there's things in our lives like that, right? You feel like there's situations in your life, your job, whatever it may be, that just are there just to make you hurt and bring you pain, right? And Paul, what he does is he prays to God. He says, God, take this away from me. Three different times he prays to God to take away that thorn in the flesh. You know what the Lord's answer was? It says this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, it's when we're at our weakest state It's when we feel like we have no more resources that we can't possibly go on. That's when God's grace swoops in to rescue us and lift us up and help us through. It's when his grace truly shines. His strength is really made perfect in our weaknesses. It's because we've reached the point where we can't do it, God. I'm not good enough. I cannot get over this. I can't break through. I can't move on. And God is like, that's great because here's some grace. And this grace of mine will help you carry on. You know, that grace, it seems to come in just at the right moment for us as well. There's this missionary named George Mueller. And George Mueller, he started orphanages. And he started everything just based purely on prayer. He would pray to God for things and God would deliver. And time and time again, George Mueller's prayers were answered and he saw God show up with grace and with help in his time of need. I mean, these orphanages were very needy places. Sometimes they would get a whole group of kids that would be coming into the orphanages and they wouldn't have beds for them. They wouldn't have rooms for them. They would need to rent more rooms or build another building. And you would have no resources left. And then a businessman would come in with a $10,000 check and say, here you go, buy some beds for the kids. Right? Or it'd be times when after feeding all of those kids that they just ran completely out of food where they have nothing left to offer the kids, and then there'd be a knock on the door, and people with bags and bags of groceries would show up just giving them this food in their time of need. And that's what God's grace does for us. See, we can go through this life, especially during this time, and face these hardships and feel like we have nothing left to give. We have no energy left. We're just depleted and drained and feel depressed and sad. And that's when God's grace can show up in our time of need and give us the strength to keep moving forward and give us the power to keep going and endure no matter what comes our way. We have the grace of God to help us endure and to help us press on, even through our most difficult of moments. God's grace is there for our help in our time of need. But these verses get a little more specific than just giving of grace to us all. It tells us who delivers this grace. Who's the one with the knock at the door with the bags and bags of grace? 
It's Jesus Christ. Look at these verses. Galatians 6, 18, it says, Brethren, the grace of who our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Then in these three verses, in Philippians 4, 23, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 28, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 18, it repeats the same words in every verse. It says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That the grace of Jesus is going to be with you. And even the very last verse in the entire Bible, Revelation 22, 21 says this, the same thing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. See, it's really this idea, this principle, that Jesus is always going to show up. That Jesus is always with you no matter what. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're having to endure, Jesus is there by your side. Here's, here's the thing. This was such an important principle in the early church. See, the early church was one of the most heavily persecuted groups of all time. Right? They were persecuted by governments. They were persecuted by their own countrymen. They were persecuted by everyone. There's times when they were literally hunted down and killed and imprisoned just for believing in Christ, just for following the word of God, just for following the Christian way. They were persecuted time and time again. They had to flee their homes, leave their families. And when you get into that part of life, when you feel like everything in the whole world is against you, when you feel like you have nothing and no one there and you just feel so lonely and depressed, it's in those times that you need to remember that you are never alone. That Christ is still there with you by your side. He's always there. He's never left. And when you're in your darkest times, Jesus is there. And he's there showing up with bags and bags of grace to help give you the strength to endure. See, this is what gave that early church their courage. That even though it seemed like the whole world was against them, they kept going and they kept producing more Christians and making more disciples and kept on mission because they knew that Jesus was with them. They knew that he had never left them. He knew he, they knew that he was right there by their side. You know, we feel the same, don't we? We feel the same, especially during rough times of life. We just feel alone. We feel sad. We feel depressed. We feel like no one else really understands what we're going through. No one else really gets what's going on in our minds and the thoughts that we have and, and our problems within our own heart. No one truly understands it or gets it. Right? We feel that way many times. The truth is, Jesus knows. He knows exactly what we're going through. He knows exactly how we feel. And he is there by our side, bringing grace and comfort in our time of need. If we just look to him. See, God gives us the grace that we need when we need it. And Jesus is always there providing for us comfort in our time of need. Amen. Let it be so. But there's a second way that this is used. It's actually used in this way. It's used in declaration of God's dominion and God's glory. Let's look at a couple verses. It says this in Romans 11, 36. For of him... And through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. What this is saying is that Jesus, God, they receive everything. Everything belongs to them. Everything belongs to God. There's nothing that doesn't belong to him and is for him and is to him and through him and by him. It belongs, everything, everything belongs to God. And he receives the glory from that. Ephesians 3.21 says this, Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. 
This idea that God is going to receive all the glory. He's going to use the church of God to receive his glory, right? And world without end. His glory is never going to stop. His glory will never end. For ages and ages to come, God will always be the one receiving the glory from this world. In 1 Timothy 1.17, it says this, Now unto the King eternal, the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He is the King. God is the King. He has all authority. He is in charge. This is His world. It belongs to Him. And He is going to receive all the honor and glory. And Jude one twenty five sums it up beautifully as well. It says, The only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. See, this is God's world. He is our Savior. He is going to be, receive all the glory. He's going to receive all the majesty. He has dominion, meaning he has the authority. He has the control over this whole earth. He has the power. He has all powers to him. There's nothing that can defeat him. He is all powerful. And he is going to receive all the glory, both now and forever. See, what this is really saying, if you break all these verses down, and there's many more of them, but if you break them down, it's really saying this. God is in control. He is always in control. Always, 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 God is in control. There's never a moment when God isn't in control. There's never a time when something is defeating God. There's never a time when something is making his plans go all askew. God is always in control. He always has the authority. He always has the power. And nothing can tear that down. Nothing can break that apart because God is in control. He has all the power of the whole universe. He has all the authority. He has all the beauty and majesty in this world. He is in control. And if there's anything that should drive us to our knees in absolute worship of our great God, it is this idea that God is in control. That God, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what difficulties I'm facing, no matter what problems are being thrown at my way, I know you are in control. That God has a plan and his plan is good and his plan is right and his plan is beautiful and it's bigger and greater and more imaginative than our puny brains could ever hope to comprehend. And yet God is working all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. He is doing things for his glory and our good, and he's always in control, and he's never going to be defeated. The coronavirus can't defeat God. Nothing that we're going through now can ever defeat his plan. He is in control. It's something we have to remember, because so many times what we do is we look down at this world that's around us, and we see its brokenness, and we see its evilness, and we see how people are hateful, and we see how there's just fighting, and there's wars, and there's diseases, and there's depression, and there's just all these things that just seem bad. And we become so focused on the world, and we can feel that way, where all those things start to influence us and impact us, where we become hateful and bitter towards this world, and we don't want to see good happen. We need to look up. We need to look up into the God of the universe. We need to look to the one that creates the clouds. We need to look to the one who placed every single star in its place. To the one that formed the mountain peaks and the one that keeps our hearts beating in this very second we need to look to him and know that he is in control. That God, the all-powerful God of the universe, the never-stopping, never-ending, immortal king of this planet is in control. That we can trust in that and to that we can say amen and amen again and again and again because he's in control. 
So all of this is going on down here, all of the terribleness, all of the sadness, all of the brokenness, it doesn't defeat our joy. It doesn't defeat our hope in a God of the universe that is truly in control and is working all things out for his power and his glory and our good. God is in control. Amen and amen. You know, Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he, he only used the word amen, as we've been using it at the end of the sentence, two times. Two times that we read about in the Gospels that Jesus actually used the word amen. And it comes in these two forms. First is in Matthew 6, 18. It's at the end of the model prayer where he says this, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The end of Jesus' model prayer there, the Lord's prayer, he points to God. He says, you, this is your kingdom. You're in control. You have all the power of the universe. It's your authority. And to you be glory forever. All the people of the earth are going to worship God, are going to glorify him because of his power and authority. Amen. The second time Jesus uses it is in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It's when he's giving this great commission, the mission that the, all of us as disciples of Jesus Christ should follow. It says, go you into all the world and teach all nations. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then in verse 20, this is what he says. Teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. And he ends it with this. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. You see, the two times that Jesus uses this word, amen, it's in a declaration of God's power and authority and glory. And it's a reminder to us that he is always going to be with us. That's the amazing thing, is that Jesus promises to never leave our side. And that we know the promise is true, that God is always in control. And with those two principles in mind, nothing can defeat us. It doesn't matter if we've gone down to purple tier again, because you know why? Jesus is with us and God is still in control. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much persecution we feel as Christians. Why? Because God is in control and Jesus is always with us. It doesn't matter what problems we're going through with our family, with our jobs, with our relationships, just internally the problems that we're going through with our own emotions. God is always in control. And Jesus is always with us. So every time, every time we say the words, Amen, we need to remember these things. We need to remember that Jesus never leaves us or forsakes us. That he promises to be with us always. No matter what we're going through, Jesus is there by our side, picking us up, carrying us, giving us the grace we need and the strength we need to go on and on and on no matter what. And we need to remember that God is in control. In this very moment, in this very second, God is ordaining his plan. And his plans are being carried out to perfection. And we know that his plans are good and right and glorious. He is in control. And to that we can say amen. And we can say we're in purple again, but still we say amen. We say amen that Jesus is next to us. We say amen that God is, has all the power and authority is in control. So every time we utter that word, amen, I want you to remember those two things. God is in control. And Jesus is right there by your side. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful and wonderful day. Thank you for being in control and having the almighty authority. 
that we can trust that you are good and you're doing what is right. Thank you for giving us Jesus to help us endure and press on and go forward, to be by our side, to comfort us even when we're going through our hardest trials. And we pray all these things in his name. And to all these things we say, amen. Bye, guys.